Well, hello and welcome to the annual Governance for Planetary Health Equity Lecture. This event is doubling as the launch of the new Planetary Health Equity Hothouse, locally known as the Hothouse, which is led by Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow, fellow Professor Sharon Friel. And as such, we are delighted that she's giving today's talk. My name is Kate Hannan. and I will be your chair for the session. I am the director of RegNet, which is the School of Regulation and Global Governance here at the Australian National University. I'm delighted to see so many colleagues joining us and they're still joining us um, for this fa fantastic event as this lecture marks an important new program of research for our school. Before we tell you a little bit more about the work and introduce our speaker, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the unceded lands on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to elders past and present. RegNet is located on Nungawa and Nambri country, but I know many of you are joining us from lands near and very far. In acknowledging and paying respect to the continuing cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, we as a school recognize their strength, resilience, and enduring connection to the lands of this continent. I also want to extend that respect to First Nations colleagues who are on the call today. Before I introduce the woman who has inspired this event, I should go over some housekeeping items. Please do note that this, record, this presentation will be recorded and is actually being recorded now. That is your name and your voice will be recorded and visible to others listening to the webinar. Later on in the session, after Professor Friel's talk, there'll be an opportunity for Q&A. Um, and to manage such a large group, we're gonna ask that you try to use your raise your hand function. We'll have the chat. I'll try to monitor as best I can um, if you have a question and comment at that time. And if you're on social media, you can jump on Twitter and tweet live. Um, using the handle ANU Regnet or at ANU R-E-G-N-E-T. So with that housekeeping behind us, let me introduce our speaker who is likely known to many of you. Professor Sharon Friel is an ARC Laureate Fellow, Professor of Health Equity, and Director of the Menzies Center for Health Governance here in the ANU School of Regulation and Global Governance. She's also a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Social Sciences, co-director of the NHMRC Research Center for Research Excellence, sorry about that, um, in the social determinants of health equity and a chief investigator on several other research collaborations that focus on policy and governance issues associated with health inequities. Her previous appointments are notable, having served as the director of our school from 2014 to 2019 and as an Australian Research Council Future Fellow from 2010 to 2014. While based at the University College London, she was the head of the Sec Scientific Secretariat of the World Health Organization Commission on the Social Determinants of Health between 2005 and 2008. So given this vast body of work, it probably comes as no surprise that her international peers voted her one of the world's most influential female leaders in global health in 2014. That said, Professor Friel has authored over 200 publications and has an expansive research agenda, which we'll learn more about today. Her work spans the political economy of health equity, governance related to social determinants of health inequities, trade and investment, food systems, urbanization, and climate change. While this is an oppressive list of items um, and areas of importance, I think it's really valuable to note that a distinguishing feature of Sharon's research is how she, working with a range of collaborators, addresses how these are in fact overlapping areas of concern, which must not be approached in isolation if we are make, to make systemic and positive change. Her 2019 book, Climate Change and the People's Health, which was published by Oxford University Press, provides a clear articulation of why she adopts a systems approach to studying these issues, including advocating for the use of analytic tools from across the sciences, the social sciences, and even the humanities to inform policy and practice. This talk gives a preview of her next phase of work, which is under the umbrella of a new initiative, the Planetary Health Equity Hothouse, which focuses on three major and interconnected challenges, a rising public health burden, inequality, and climate change. That said, you aren't here to listen to me speak about Sharon and her work, but to actually hear from her. So I will hand it over to her now, who will share a little bit more about this ARC Laureate funded initiative, after which I'll try to take back over and assist with fielding questions, I'll do my best. Again, there's many of you, so we'll see how we go. And Sharon, before I turn it over to you, congrats on this wonderful achievement. We really look forward to supporting it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, yeah, delighted to join colleagues. So let me just uh, share the screen and I'll kick off. 
before I start, let me acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the first Australians on whose land I'm talking to you from, uh, and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'm really so delighted to join you today to launch the Planetary Health Equity Hot House uh, and provide the kickoff lecture uh, on governance for planetary health equity, which is what the, uh, the programme of work is really all about. So the effects of human-caused global warming are absolutely, of course, happening now. They are irreversible on the timescale of people alive today, and they're going to worsen in the decades to come. And even if we ended fossil fuel use today, we're on track for a temperature increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by the 2030s. There are different types of inequities associated with climate change. Previous and current generations generally in high income countries have put in place massive intergenerational inequities through their greenhouse gas emissions and environmental disruption. And the impacts are already terrifying. Glaciers and ice sheets are shrinking River and lake ice is breaking up earlier. Plant and animal geographic ranges are shifting. We've accelerated sea level rise and we have longer, more intense heat waves, floods and droughts. And the recent State of Environment report for Australia, where I live, warns that climate change is threatening every ecosystem in this country. So climate change and health. Climate has been identified as the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. As temperatures spike, so does heat exhaustion, heat stroke and cardiovascular and kidney diseases. Rising temperatures worsen air pollution by increasing ground level ozone smog. Dirtier air we know is linked to higher hospital admission rates higher death rates for asthmatics and people suffering from cardiac and pulmonary disease. As land and sea undergo rapid changes, animals that inhabit them will disappear if they don't adapt quickly enough. And just think of the, the bees, the pollinators. Uh, without the pollinators, food security becomes an issue. Droughts and floods also put pressures on food stocks, on livelihoods and in food prices, but they also create incredible uh, risks for physical and mental health. Rising sea level uh, rises, uh, sorry, uh, rising sea level uh, threaten coastal systems, droughts, floods, incredible uh, disasters leave communities also highly vulnerable to anxiety, PTSD and mosquito-borne diseases. And with those uh, floods and sea level uh, rises, the risks for coastal systems and low-lying areas such as major, major population centres like Sydney, like Mumbai, like Rio de Janeiro, like Los Angeles, Miami and New York City bring incredible risks to life. So it's not good. Uh, and with all of that comes a real risk of a planetary health equity crisis. And by that, I mean the equitable enjoyment of good health in a stable ecosystem is becoming a real challenge. And that plays out in a number of ways between uh, and within countries. The increasing economic inequality due to global warming and some analysis that's been done has shown that for most poor countries, there's more than a 90% likelihood that per capita GDP is lower today than if global warming hadn't occurred. And that we know undermines the capacity of those countries to spend on health, on social and other essential services uh, for health. Within countries, we see the confluence of climate change, social disadvantage and health. 
The recent Australian floods pictured here are sadly a very good example of this confluence. In 2022, 82% of populations living in the Lismore Town Centre flood footprint area here resided in the most disadvantaged socioeconomic quintile neighbourhoods. In 2017, the Northern Rivers flood event, which included Lismore uh, Town as well, was no different. The majority of people directly affected in flood areas came from the most socially, socioeconomically marginalised communities, including people in receipt of income support, people living with a disability, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. These communities were much more likely to be evacuated, displaced for long periods, and suffered worse mental health and wellbeing outcomes than other groups. And very, very little improved in the daily living conditions for those communities between 2017 and 2022, resulting in inadequate and inequitable adaptation. So I imagine you might agree with me that attention to the interconnected challenges of climate change, inequality and health is vital. And I'm really, I've only really sort of touched on uh, small aspects uh, of that interplay uh, between those three things. And there's been no shortage of evidence of policy documents or calls to action about the types of action that is needed to adapt to the locked-in climate change, to mitigate further climate change, to reduce inequality, and to address the social determinants of health inequities. And the evidence has been around for a long time now. The Club of Rome alerted the world to these risks back in 1972, and yet nothing happens. There is no planet B. There is no planet blah, 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 blah. Build back better, blah, blah, blah. Green economy, blah, blah, blah. This is all we hear from our so-called leaders. Words, words that sound great, but so far has led to no action. Of course, we need constructive dialogue but they've now had 30 years of blah, 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 and where has that led us? So, I mean, I don't think anybody can say it better than Greta Thunberg, but really the question of why is nothing happening? Why has there been so little effective remedial transformative action, not just the tinkering at the edges that we see, and the big question of what are the conditions that actually can make that uh, action happen. And that's the rationale for the Planetary Health Equity Hot House. The Hot House, as Kate uh, mentioned as its shorthand, is the initiative of my Australian Research Council Laureate Fellowship, which started in April this year and runs for five years. Based, as Kate mentioned, so based in the School of Regulation and Global Governance at the Australian National University, our intention is to be global in reach and to be a centre of research excellence and governance for planetary health equity. And I do just want to sort of pause and acknowledge that the Hot House and the Laureate Fellowship didn't appear out of nowhere. It builds on many years of collaboration with others in Australia and beyond, including Fran Baum, uh, now down at Adelaide University, Sir Michael Marmot and the WHO Commission, uh, on the social determinants of health, with the late Tony McMichael, more recently with colleagues Ashley Schramm and Belinda Townsend here in the Menzies Centre for Health Governance. And I've said this before, I don't think this would have happened uh, without being located within the School of Regulation and Global Governance at the ANU. There are, of course, many others that I collaborated with who have influenced my work incredibly, so really thank you to everybody. So our goals in the hot house uh, are grand and they're multiple. We aim to generate evidence to inform ambitious public policy that optimizes this intersection between climate change, social equity and health equity, 
uh, outcomes based on uh, mitigation actions. So we're really focusing on mitigation rather than adaptation. And to understand market activity uh, that serves planetary health equity interests. The big question, of course, is how to put that into action, which is ultimately a governance question, and particularly about the empowerment of progressive public institutions with the confidence and the capability to act in the interests of planetary health equity. And we'll be examining that as a key question. And not only will we be doing the, the research and generating this understanding, but I really hope through proactive engagement with policymakers, with politicians, with international organisations, business and civil society, that we might actually help inform and stimulate uh, some action. So we'll focus on that intersection between climate change, inequality and health in a very integrated way. We'll do it through a systems lens. Yes, that's supposed to be a systems icon. Um, and then we will take a very explicit focus examining uh, the political economy uh, driving these systems, explicitly focusing on power and on governance. There's three main programmes of work. First, there will be an examination, as I said, of that political economy driving the system that's contributing to planetary health inequity. So an expose of the system, an identification uh, of the, the, and the design of policies that can optimise that intersection between climate, social and health outcomes and of commercial activities that are needed to do the same. So planetary health equity in all policies and the commercial determinants of planetary health equity. Don't you love the, the acronyms? And um, that's what that is in the red there. And then most importantly, we'll seek to understand the conditions, the institutions, the actors, the combination of actors, the processes, the ideas that will enable the necessary structural reforms to implement such policies and market activity. We're going to draw on example cases from across different sectors, from energy, from food, from housing, infrastructure and beyond. We'll have an Australian focus, but we will certainly uh, be global in the analysis and looking at what's happening, good practice from around the world and drawing on a real diversity of methodologies, quantitative, qualitative, uh, a whole spectrum. I'll come back to that uh, in a second. And we know a little bit about the system, you know, this the, the consumptogenic system is how I refer to it, described here as this system of institutions, of policies, of commercial activities, of norms that really incentivize and reward excessive production and consumption of fossil fuel goods and services, many of which are unhealthy and many of them are very unequitably valued and distributed. But we don't really know the detail of this system and certainly not in any empirical and integrated way. So we're going to be studying the actors we're going to be studying the different interests at play in the system. We're going to be studying the ideas that drive the system, that keep it moving in the direction that it's moving. And we're going to be studying this at different levels. So really a, a who's who in the planetary health and equity zoo and how it got us into this mess. And we're really lucky, one of our new uh, laureate research fellows, Nick Frank, who joined yesterday, Nick is an economist, a political scientist, uh, who's done lovely work examining superstructures and networks and, and will really help uh, drive this uh, type of analysis. So watch out for a number of very messy uh, social network maps in uh, the months to come. But ultimately, we don't want to just focus on the problem. We want to move from the harmful system uh, to pursue planetary health equity goals. And in essence, you might argue this is a restructuring of contemporary capitalism. And so the two work programmes will focus on generating a roadmap to get there. 
The second programme of work is going to qualitatively assess the impact of current intersectoral policy and business finance practices on planetary health equity and make recommendations for change. So it's going to be about understanding the necessary direction uh, and types of action in energy, trade, food systems, housing, infrastructure, for example. It'll be understanding the direction that needs to be set by uh, institutions and organisations, COP27, OECD, the World Health Organisation, the World Trade Organisation, for example. What about transnational corporations? What about the finance sector? What should all of that look like? and all the time keeping climate change, inequality and health tightly uh, together. And one of the key challenges for all of this and for planetary health equity is the intersectorality of the necessary policy options. I've been in this game for quite a while, trying to inform, understand and inform action on the social determinants of health equity. And I know that getting institutional recognition and coherent action across sectors remains extremely difficult for a number of, of reasons. So let me give an example. I'm going to use the, the food uh, sector as an example. So agricultural policy. Agricultural policy oriented to intensive farming has helped to increase meat, egg and milk production by about 140% since the 1960s. So a massive transformation has taken place in the availability uh, and the accessibility of cheap protein sources with incredible economic and social benefits. However, the sector is one of the primary drivers of the most serious environmental harms. A little indication on the slide uh, there. And climate mitigation policy calls for decarbonisation of animal agriculture with constraints on livestock production. However, notably, the recent uh, OECD FAO uh, agricultural outlook for the next uh, couple of decades projects that stocks of farmed animals for meat will actually increase during the next decade and meat emissions will rise by 5% by 2030. So you start to see the incoherence from a health policy perspective, we are recommended to eat a balanced diet with not too much animal source foods because animal source protein and the accompanying saturated fats brings a risk of cardiovascular disease, colorectal cancer and type 2 diabetes. Many years ago, this was back in oh, 2009 when we published this, we did an analysis to see what the mitigation policy mix would need to look like to meet the necessary agricultural sector emissions in the UK and Brazil. This was with colleagues at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And the implications for health outcomes, and that's referred to as a, a co-benefits approach, action in one uh, policy domain, what are the co-benefits in another uh, policy domain? And you can see the analysis there on the slide. So what it required to get to those uh, mitigation uh, uh, outcomes was technological change in farming practices and a 30% reduction in the production of livestock. And besides being politically impossible, uh, and this most certainly wasn't inside the Overton window, these policy responses have all sorts of equity implications, which we didn't analyze at the time, but it's certainly something that we'll be paying attention into this program of work. Equity issue, you know, a global environmental justice question, who has emitted and who's uh, been impacted by these emissions? The income and livelihoods along the supply chains, if such incredible changes were to take place. And of course, the global nutrition equity uh, question, some countries and some populations don't have enough uh, animal protein intake from a, a nutrition and a health perspective. So really quite profound equity implications at play in those different policy uh, mixes. And what you see happening in these debates, and certainly when we produced those analyses, where the tensions, the comp competing ideas and interests at play between the different policy domains, 
what I'm showing on the slide is by no means complete. I just wanted to give you a bit of a sense of, of what I mean by these different competing interests and ideas in that world of, of, of agriculture and um, what I've just spoken about. And so you see the, the norms and the guidance that comes from different uh, international organisations. You see the domestic uh, policy priorities and interests. So vitally important if we have to think about the intersectorality of action across these different policy domains, trying to achieve planetary health equity outcomes, we've really got to understand and rec recognise and understand uh, these um, competing interests and, and ideas if we're going to achieve, achieve this. And so in work, in that second uh, programme of work, what we will be doing is developing a methodology that enables an examination of what is ideal in terms of the policy mix that optimises climate, health uh, and social uh, outcomes of these mitigation act, uh, actions, bearing in mind these different uh, tensions. So I don't want us to be focused on the problem. I want us to move to uh, that ambitious uh, policy mix. And in addition uh, to the government policy, we're very interested in the commercial determinants of planetary health equity. The policies and practices and products of commerce that affect the environment and human health equity. And we know there's a, a, a growing field called the commercial determinants of health and uh, beautiful analyses by colleagues across the world have shown the range of strategies uh, that commercial actors use in their pursuit to maximise profits. There's market practices to develop, produce and sell their commodities. There's business practices uh, focused on the running of the business, of on their activities. And there's the poli uh, political practices to secure a social contract to operate, think of uh, corporate social responsibility, and to create a favourable policy and regulatory environment. These are all completely standard practices of, of capitalism, really, and I'll come back to these uh, later. But I do just want to focus a little on financialization, the newer face of capitalism, where the profits accrue primarily through financial channels rather than through trade and commodity production. And this financialization is something that we will focus on in the hot house. So keeping with the food theme, let me just explain a little bit about that financialization. So what you're looking at here on this very, very messy slide on the left hand side are the protein producers that supply the largest global food manufacturers, retailers and restaurant chains. So reaching billions of customers globally. So what they produce really matters. So global food companies on the right hand side, McDonald's, Nestle, Walmart, they buy from these producers. Uh, they get their meat, their fish and dairy from many of these uh, suppliers. A review of the ownership of these producers looking at shareholder data shows that the institutional investors are the second largest group of shareholders. So they hold a lot of sway in the behaviour, in the practices of those companies. And I just want you to note those top three names. So Vanguard, State Street and BlackRock. The world's three largest asset managers, they collectively own more than 27% of shares in fossil fuel giants, as well as in those uh, protein producers, and actually over 30% of major agribusiness companies. This makes these asset managers among the largest shareholders in the two industries, arguably most responsible for emissions driving the climate crisis and closely connected to global health inequities. Yet none of those three or any of the top 30 financial institutions have required companies in their portfolios to quit coal, oil and gas projects. Imagine if these investors committed to not launching any new product without robust 
coal exclusion criteria or for existing funds to say to those fossil fuel developers uh, well, to vote against them uh, in terms of their company uh, portfolio mix. And so as with public policy, our research in this programme of work will examine what is ideal in terms of the market direction and activity that achieves planetary health equity goals. And really to do all of that, to address climate change inequality, poor health uh, and their uh, intersection is fundamentally a test of state capacity and of effective governance within and between countries. We clearly need major structural change. And to quote Mariana Mazzucato, both in terms of how government is structured and how business is run and how public and private organisations interrelate. And we'll do that in our third programme of work. We'll seek to understand the conditions that empower progressive institutions and examine the challenges and opportunities for creating those coherent policy, business and finance practices that we've identified earlier on. So that really means we're going to be studying the processes of policy making, the structures in which business decisions are made, the power dynamics between public, private, state, non-state, health and other interests, and the strategies and tactics used by different actors uh, to advance their interests. And rather than being hampered by the current dominant ideas of free market and educating the public, which is really what sets our current policy settings, We'll seek to understand how alternative ideas can be elevated, how to elevate a social model of health, sustainable prosperity into the realms of political possibility and to the mainstream. We'll examine how to transition from states focusing on fixing things, being very reactive, usually um, by the bads made by the market, to actually driving innovation in both policy and the market. Imagine, well, and we'll seek to understand how to lay down progressive policy legacies. We saw real glimmers of possibility in some countries during COVID when governments introduced policies that were previously considered impossible. I've mentioned this key challenge for planetary health equity, which is that boundary spanning nature of it. It's every policy domain's responsibility. And so it becomes no one's how, how to manage that. And then, of course, key to driving institutions to work in the public interest and particularly towards planetary health equity goals requires a fit for purpose regulatory apparatus. And we'll examine what that looks like. And we know that understanding uh, how to affect a progressive policy agenda and an emboldened state, we, we really need to understand the role of influencers, business, both in terms of opposition and of support uh, for recommended uh, policy approaches. And then civil society, the literature tells, the social movement literature tells us that a noisy civil society and public is key to generating a demand, obviously, uh, and accountability for government action. And so that brings me to power. Arguably, absolutely nothing will change unless the entrenched power inequities across these systems that I've described are addressed. Powerful consumptogenic interests, corporations and conservative actors work very, very hard to control the narrative, to set the rules of the game and to underwrite right social and political rights and norms. Recently, the United Nations Secretary General noted with the IPCC uh, report that wealthy economies and corporations are not just turning a blind eye. They are adding fuel to the flames. They are choking our planet based on their vested interests and historic investments in fossil fuels. And we're just publishing a, a piece in The Lancet to all about this intersection with power and planetary health equity. And one of the big issues is ideational power. We've seen this pervasive neoliberal fetishism 
of market forces, financialization, hyper-globalization, deregulation, and individualism, which has shaped domestic and international processes, institutions. And this entrenches uh, these consumptogenic interests and arguably a biomedical model of health. Remember, I really would love us to see the elevation of a social model, model of health. And all of that is at odds with planetary health equity goals. The ideational power of these consumptogenic interests influence that velocity and direction of change. They use these neoliberal ideas to shape what is politically acceptable, control the, 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 the public narrative and the policy flaming. And what we get is this lifestyle drift, as it's been referred to. Uh, Fran, Fran Brown has done gorgeous work around lifestyle drift. You know, this idea of eat less. Here's another leaflet will tell you how to eat less or eat differently or turn off the lights or drive an electric car, all of which are really important but it is about the promotion of individualism rather than tackling the structural action that is vitally important. And then the material power of these consumptogenic interests through donations, through the revolving door and through lobbying allow consumptogenic interests to shape political and policy agendas. For example, here in Australia, a uh, recent analysis showed that corporate capture of the major political parties prevented the implementation of at least 24 areas of policy relevant to decarbonisation. But all is not lost. Um, everyone has power, not just the corporations and conservative elites. Drawing on the work that we did in the NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence on Health Equity, and this is the Health Equity Power Framework, uh, that myself and colleagues produced from that. We'll use this to study different types of power, different forms of power, the different spaces where power is playing out and the at different levels in the planetary health equity system. How do the different actors, state, market, civil society, advance their interests? And the aim of that analysis is to identify the strategies and tactics by which those actors interested in planetary health equity can effectively change that narrative from the individual responsibility to state and commercial responsibility, can reset the rules of the game to prioritise people and the environment over profits, and to reaffirm those social and political rights and norms in the public interest. So how are we going to do all of this? Who are we? Uh, there's a a lovely, a lovely team, as it were. We're a small core team. Uh, we're a small interdisciplinary team from public health, economics, political science, global governance, environmental science, the spaces are up there. I'm delighted uh, to be working with two new laureate research fellows, Nick Frank, I mentioned, who joined yesterday, and Megan Arthur, who'll join from the University of Edinburgh uh, in a few months and Jocelyn Cutler, who's the Senior Project Officer. And I have to pause and give a huge thanks to Joss for all of the, the prep work in getting us to here. It's been really uh, so much work, a huge, huge thank you. The Laureate Fellowship also includes two PhD students who will start uh, next year, and we have part-time research assistants, including the marvellous Sharna Golden, who will be working with us on and off. And I would also just like to acknowledge and thank other ANU colleagues, Erin Walsh from the National Centre for Epidemiology and Population Health, who did all of the hothouse designs, the incredible Michael Warren and CAP team uh, for their incredible work with the website, and my wonderful RegNet colleagues, uh, particularly professional staff who've just uh, made this happen. Thank you so much. We also have an advisory board which comprises world-renowned academics with expertise in public health, environmental justice, economics, political studies, and key change makers from government, international organisations, business, civil society, and the media. These are the confirmed members uh, listed here. There's just a, a few more um, I'm just waiting confirmation on. 
And the purpose of the board really will absolutely help strengthen our expertise, but really help guide uh, the translation of the evidence in real time, I hope, into policy and action here in Australia and internationally, and provide all sorts of opportunities uh, for knowledge mobilisation and collaborations uh, beyond uh, our, our smaller uh, grouping. We also have a, a programme of work called the Associate Fellows. So academic staff, PhD students, master students from across the Australian National University, other universities in Australia and internationally are invited to join the Hot House as Associate Fellows. I'm delighted, and this is their, their pictures up here, we've already got 22 uh, ANU fellows coming from four of our six uh, colleges and I'll be reaching out in the coming weeks and months to others across the university, across Australia and internationally. And what I really hope is through this network uh, of academics, researchers, that we can build a critical mass of interdisciplinary experts in governance for planetary health equity. We can infuse a diversity of methodologies into all of our, our work. Practically, this might look like collaboration on specific projects, joint publications, future grant applications, engagement in reading groups, theory, methods workshops, writing workshops, and in uh, the, the hothouse public facing events, including an annual symposium on governance for planetary health equity, other policy roundtables and podcasts, which we're going to set up. There are some other uh, mechanisms that we're putting in place. We will have a future leader program kicking off next year. And there's a, a little bit of money in the, the laureate to enable PhDs and early career researchers from other institutions in Australia and beyond to come and spend time with us in the hot house to spark uh, new ideas for collaboration and so on. And then the Distinguished Visitors Programme is to promote collaboration and use of our research by people from policy, advocacy, business here in Australia and internationally. And again, uh, an exchange uh, mechanism uh, kicking off next year. We'll also have an annual oration. Uh, today, I've spent quite a, bit, quite a bit of time telling you about the actual hothouse and focusing on the problem. All subsequent planetary health equity hothouse orations will look to the future, really discussing cutting edge research, emerging policy and practice challenges and opportunities and suggestions for ways forward. And I mentioned the annual Governance for Planetary Health Equity a symposium here in Canberra with researchers, policymakers, NGOs, business groups, uh, so you'll be hearing much more uh, from me about that. So this is, I'm sure you'll agree, a huge agenda, which really can only be tackled uh, collectively. And I really do hope that the Hot House can serve as a useful vehicle uh, to help us all work together through exchanges, collaborative uh, projects through seminars, podcasts. If you're interested in being part of it, please do reach out. We've got uh, the email address, there's the Twitter handle, the website is live now. Um, so please do, do reach out to us. Uh, so thank you very much indeed for joining today. Uh, I hope this has sparked some ideas. If you don't think that you do work in planetary health equity, I'm sure you'll, well, I hope you'll have heard that really this touches on so many different uh, disciplinary areas, sectors, uh, and yeah, across, uh, across the, the whole spectrum of society. So I'm going to stop there and I hope that gives us a little bit of time for a uh, discussion. So let me stop sharing my screen. Terrific. Thanks so much, Sharon. And people are already clapping and we will spend some, we will set aside some time for that as well. Um, but anyone who's looked at the chat has seen you're already getting questions. So we might jump into them if that's all right. 
Um, our first question indicates markets can be used to address climate change. Economists I've spoken to agree that a global levy on fossil fuels with the revenue to be used to address loss and damage from climate change would be a good idea. Is this at all possible? And, and Sharon, I might just add to that, if you do think it's possible, could you elaborate just a little bit about how your work might inform that? Will I respond now, Kate? Or... I think it'd be great. Yeah, I think we've got a good balance that we can do that. Yeah, so, so I think it's going to be really important that we look at the spectrum of uh, policy options and that we look at the spectrum and, and market uh, options and that we look at the spectrum of what has been successful in other contexts or in a range of contexts. So that's my way of saying I'm not entirely sure just yet, but the idea of a levy that then gets used for, and I'll put in, in inverted commas, uh, the public interest and public goods is it's not a new idea. So we've seen that happening in health, for example. So with tobacco, uh, there was a hypothecated, you know, the tax uh, on tobacco was ring fenced for use uh, for health uh, purposes. And that's been incredibly successful. So there is a precedent for that sort of approach being effective. So we would look into whether that would be a very sensible mix in terms of market activity, but great idea. Great. Great. And we have another second question from our colleague, Peter Grabowski, who asks, you know, does global population overpopulation matter? And if so, what can be done? Thanks, Peter. So, yeah, the, the population question isn't something that, well, isn't something that I've examined and isn't something that's currently captured. But you, it's a, a very important reminder to engage with our demographers here within the ANU and beyond. Um, I think there's you know the 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 the, the big questions uh, around uh, gender equity uh, that you know I haven't addressed that uh, today, but is a, a major question, which is also a major question when it comes to population questions. Uh, so again, I'm not going to give a, a definitive answer on that, but I think a, a a really important reminder to have those conversations with. Uh, with demographers and others who really understand the role uh, of populations in all of this. So thanks. No, that's great. And Roland has a question, Roland Satford, and I noticed his video is on, so I might throw to Roland to ask his question. Oh, well, thank you. Um, hello, this is a very exciting and inspiring gathering. I guess my question, as a, someone who's involved in activism and change, is what are some of the more encouraging examples of governance towards planetary health equity that you've seen in the world already? Oh, well, and first of all, thank you, Roland. You're on the <laughs> advisory board. I'm so excited that CAHA is, is engaged. It's going to be uh, really important for us. Um, look, at, so the, this, the bringing together of climate change, inequality and health is quite new, I, I should say. Uh, and so... Have we got good examples of it from elsewhere around in, in terms of governance? Uh, I'm not sure, but we will certainly be looking for them. But I do take hope from some other social movements. You know, historically, we've seen the importance of uh, and some analysis that was led by Bell Townsend, a colleague here in RegDebt in our Centre for Research Excellence on Health Equity, um, has shown the importance of the, the coalition building with, yes, the like-minded, but the unlike-minded, the unusual bedfellows around a shared uh, mission, uh, a shared vision and goal the strategic use of uh, institutional processes. So like getting to the table, uh, we saw that with trade and health, making sure that the health voice was in the corridors, going to the stakeholder negotiations, offering suggestions as to what trade agreements could include that would be positive for health. Um, and then the, the sort of the shaming and the naming, you know, certainly the lessons from the divestment movement uh, has shown the power of that moral persuasive framing uh, for you know, divestment uh, from fossil fuels. So we're going to be looking to these different social movements, the successes and the failures of other uh, social movements 
uh, and re yeah, really just try to say, okay, well, what does that mean when you try and bring climate inequality and health to, together? And of course, we're going to be looking to Caja for some examples of how you do it. Great, thanks. Nika, we might throw to you next. Thanks, Sharon, really enjoyed that. Uh, you picked up on some of my question in your last response, but you um, you highlighted like a lot of major structural issues which are responsible for planetary health inequity, um, capitalism, uh, financialization, and, and so on. Um, I'm wondering how you're thinking about the, the governance recommendations which might come out of the project and what kind of level they'll be pitched at, whether they'll be kind of pitched at addressing those fundamental structural issues uh, whether it's more a matter of kind of redirecting um, the current system, trying to steer it in a different in a different way. Um, yeah, so just after your, the way you're thinking about processes uh, of change. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so again, I don't have a definitive answer. It's a great question, Nico. I, I don't have the definitive answer. I, I hope we'll be closer to that in a few years' time. Um, but my sense... So I, I'm I'm I I don't really believe well I don't really see how we get a complete throwing out of what we've currently got, um, but I do see some incredible schisms happening in basically like sort of the neoliberal form of capitalism today, uh, and that's not just you know the conversations on the left; it's the conversations across the the whole of society really, the questioning of our current model of being, basically. You know, I take hope from some of the, the new uh, the, the new language and the new forms of uh, you know, the well-being uh, budgets, the well-being principles. Now we'll see how that plays out, but you know, there's that's a new policy direction. Um, so I'd like us to be examining the, the different possibilities. You know, I can imagine one of the the techniques that we might do is some of those uh, imagining scenario exercises of, and actually um, I'm, I'm pointing to Roland, he's still on my screen from CAHA, uh, the Climate and Health Alliance in Australia has done some beautiful scenario uh, vis vis visioning work. You know, if there's, uh, if we stay as we are, what does that sort of policy mix look like? Or if we do a complete structural reform, what does that look like? So we'll be we will be looking at the different uh, models. I don't have the answer yet, um, and I certainly haven't got the skill set to know the answer yet. Um, but collectively, that's what I would hope we would be really examining. It's a fundamental question, isn't it, for the direction that we would be going. Great, thanks so much, Sharon. We have a cluster of questions in the chat, which we might try to take all together. It's gonna to be ambitious, but I am mindful of time. So Sharon, that's the nice thing about this is you can kind of pick and choose how you respond. <laughs> um, so the first one is how can we create a noisy civil society? Can individuals acting in concert and creating awareness by changing social norms help motivate government to change? The next question's a little bit different which is how likely there are famines this century. I don't know if you can predict that, but it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. And then another question is about what about deconsumption and greater global inequality in terms of the use of resources? I note that Sharon, and this is the comment from the person, I note that Sharon uses equality and equity seemingly interchangeably, but they are very different beasts. One about socioeconomic sameness, often linked to growth, the other about social justice and fairness. So that might be a pretty big one to tackle. Um, but it is from a colleague, John, who we can corner in the regnet when he's here. Um, and then the last one, it sounds like constitutional change might be required, and that's a comment, but with a question mark. So perhaps a broader discussion about government and law in that. So with our remaining few minutes, Sharon, you know, go to it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I, I do want to start with the equality, equity, inequality, inequity uh, aspect. And yeah, I, I have used them interchangeably, um, although I, I had hoped that I was using equity and inequity as the, the main thing, because the, 
Um, so whilst we're very interested in outcomes and vitally, vitally interested in outcomes, it's the injustices, those social injustices that per per pervade the institutions, structures and processes that, of course, lead to the unequal distribution of these outcomes. So in my mind, it's not an either or, it's both. I don't agree that it, equality or inequality is just about the socioeconomic. It's just that's just what I've well, that's what I've studied most of, which I know most of. And I have to admit, it's my blind spot. That's where I go to. Um, but it, of course, is much, much bigger in terms of the injustices play out uh, in across all sorts of um, strat stratifiers uh, within society. I hope. Well, I've said, because somebody has said to me before, oh, you talk about the consumptogenic system and, you, and really you're talking about people's consumption. That to me is far too proximal. People's consumption is a result of this consumption and, and that's hyper-consumerism at a societal level. But what I hope I've been trying to point towards is this system, these structures that are creating this, but it's this system, these structures, the consumptogenic system of production, really, um, that we have to absolutely grapple with. And you know, others uh, have done work around the sort of the degrowth agenda. Um, others speak about sort of sustainable prosperity uh, agenda. And we will be really grappling with, and there's tensions between them, so we're going to be really grappling with all of that in the work. And, you know, again, I, I know I'm not giving any absolute answers to this, but this is big, it's the start of the process, but it's also this big collective conversation um, that I hope um, we can uh, engage with. I'm not going to say anything about in constitutional change, but other than we'll be, we have lawyers in, in the mix, so that's going to be so important. And I will just finish on a sort of a, a point of hope in terms of the creation of noisy civil society. And again, the lessons from the past where there have been incredible wins against major structural power inequities. So um, access to medicines. And so in the health world, you know, I'm very familiar with access to medicines uh, through uh, trade agreements. That was a major win that came through, partly through the power of civil society, pushing up and supporting governments in trade negotiations. Similarly, uh, the success, the implementation of the Framework Convention for Tobacco Control, a major international treaty, uh, came about through the coalescence of civil society demanding action against big tobacco. And I've mentioned the divestment movement. So, so whilst it's whilst I don't think any one person uh, can make the structural change, a lot of voices together can act, absolutely push up and demand the sorts of uh, government and market change that's essential. Wow, that's a terrific response. Thanks, Sharon. We have just a tiny bit of time left, and we're really fortunate to have our dean from the College of Asia and Pacific joining us. And I wanted to give her an opportunity just to, to speak to you all and maybe celebrate and clap Sharon's achievement also. Thank you, Kate. Um, yes, I wasn't expecting, I was hoping to be here incognito, but uh, <laughs> never possible. Never gonna happen. Never gonna happen. Um, this is such, such a terrific uh, initiative. The, um, the university, as all of you who know, uh, who work for the ANU, was established in 1946 with a, the principal mission of uh, supporting um, Australia to, to prosper and supporting Australia's place in the world, um, as well as understanding, um, and this is a particular value, of course, to our college, understanding its place in the region, Asia and the Pacific. Um, one of the things that Sharon's project and programme of work is doing is, is both 
taking those areas as central to, to what she's about, but also identifying some of the things that we as scholars have, have wrestled with uh, for many, many years, which is how do we bring our expertise together in the service of these big, big global challenges? And it is fantastic to see um, all of Sharon's work at being recognized through the laureate. Um, it is also fabulous to have Sharon as one of the, you know, the leading ambassadors of the ANU and its focus on how we actually understand and develop new knowledge that is going to change what we do, because that's essentially what uh, we are about as the National University. How do we understand, but also how do we make change? And um, I'm sure that um, many, many of you who are already involved in the project are, are just itching to get going. Those of you who are not involved, I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities to be involved. Um, but it just remains for me to do what I've been asked to do, which stop waffling on and in, ask you all to join me in giving Sharon uh, a well-deserved round of applause. Congratulations, Sharon. And good uh, thanks, Haley. <laughs> We're definitely looking forward to learn, watching how it develops. Thank you. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Kate. Yep. And thank you all for joining us. There'll be much, much more to check out. And do look at the website if you want to learn more. <laughs>